with that, I'm going to first turn it over to Nick, who's got some great data uh, that we pulled from SPINS to really kind of just kind of set the stage of what's been happening in the industry in various segments over the past four or five months or so. All right. Thanks, Mike. Um, there's been a lot of discussion over time here about kind of what's COVID doing um, to, and hang on here, there we go, trying to advance my slides. What's COVID been doing? What are the effects of it? And I think, you know, as we've gone through this, this unusual time, month by month, um, you know, things have been evolving and data has been stabilizing. So um, we've been running data on a regular basis and I figured it was time to do some digging around at you know, what's kind of the latest in trends and what does that mean at a high level for everybody? So starting off here, um, we took a look at basically all of the categories within SPINS and looked at who are or which categories are the biggest gainers. And this was actually kind of hard to do because every subcategory has its own growth trend that's underlying it or, you know, or, or its own receding trend or declining trend. And we had to factor that out. And we also had to look at you know, those two categories that have just gotten a very big lift from COVID. Um, and to net all that out, what we did is we looked at the two dollar growth numbers and took the minimum of it and then sorted the entire universe that way. So that's what you see here as our attempt to try to bring that out. And the long and short of it is, is people are indulging in alcohol and sweets, keeping their freezers full and they're growing sterile. It's pretty much as simple as that. Um, here's what's interesting when we flip it and we look at the decliners and this was a little more difficult to do that with. So we just looked at what's declined since February. Surprisingly, cold and flu products were the biggest decliners, which they should be when you think about the seasonal impact, but they probably shouldn't be with COVID, but they were. Um, a lot of other categories, as you see here, are real seasonal decliners, but the one thing that is, I think, the takeaway from this is the on-the-go items, such as gums and mints and candy, and bars is actually about five below this on this list. That's another category a lot of people have been talking about. These on-the-go items that people take with them when they're traveling, flying on planes, um, the, the consumption is down quite a bit. Um, the next way we sliced the data was to look at pantry loaders. And this was actually difficult too, but what we did is we took the growth from February to April, and then we subtracted the growth from February to June. So which items basically had the biggest growth in the middle of the pandemic, um, but actually didn't continue to grow throughout it. And so when we sorted all this out, as you take a look at it, flour, um, ingredients, things that are in the made from scratch area around the home, you know, for cooking, baking, that kind of thing, are all here. Um, that's pretty much the majority, and then butter and eggs. And I think that was just because butter and eggs seem to be pretty short in the grocery store, and I think they don't take up too much space in the fridge, so people bought a lot of them. And then there's the opposite of the pantry loaders, which is what was not impacted. And this is pretty predictable, Think things that are large in size. So you're going through the grocery store, you're going once a week, you've got a very full shopping cart. I know I spilled a few things out of mine in the grocery store back in March and April, and you just can't fit two big things of laundry detergent in there, so you don't. So it's laundry, it's large personal care things, things that get used over multiple months and weren't a concern about running out. And then another takeaway here is, how does that percolate into categories? Well, things that are large in a category, like puff snacks, which also take up a lot of space, is a good example. And then also perishables like yogurt and probiotics that you kind of have to buy every week or you know, every couple weeks. So what else is going on? Well, when we actually look at the three channels, natural enhanced, Mulo, which is conventional grocery plus club plus mass and drug and convenience, and we look at what happened over month to month, you can see February's black going month by month over to the kind of light green on the right, which is the July data. Natural and Mulo basically had a pantry loading phase and then they, they kind of trickled down and there's about a 10% plus, a little bit more than 10% permanent lift, we'll call it, or at least sustained lift, which is really you know, restaurant dollars that have been traded into retail. If you, look at restaurant, um, if you look at restaurant food, a restaurant calorie costs about twice as much as a retail calorie. So if there's 10% increase in retail, it's because about 20% of restaurant has been, or you know, food service has been traded away. Um, and then convenience, as people started to get out of shelter at home, that started going up, uh, as you can see, really in kind of the May, June, July period. So we had to take a deeper look into convenience to see what was being bought there, just because it stood out so much. And no surprise, it's beverages, alcohol, um, and frozen desserts. 
Um, so what are conventional consumers doing right now? At first they bought immunity products. There was a lot of data on that. But right now when we boil down the spins universes, it appears that con conventional consumers are starting to really over index better for your products. You know, all along here, we were thinking that COVID was going to have a rising tide where consumers are going to be thinking wellness and what can I eat and take better care of myself so that I can build a better immune system to fight off this virus. The SPINS universe is TPL is 100% of everything there. HWY is the better for you universe, which is about 30%, it's actually kind of high 20s. And NPI is the purest of the better for you, call it about 9%. It's about a third of HWI, and that's kind of the, the cleanest of the clean. So you can see in March, the knee-jerk reaction was a big drive into MPI purchases, which was immunity products and things like that. And that March period, by the way, spans from the middle of February to mid-March. And then after that, there's basically HWI, which is the kind of better for you, call it more nutrient-dense foods, things that are a, a small trade-up in price compared to the conventional product, significantly over-indexes both MPI and TPL. So that tells me that the mass consumer, the conventional consumer, the one that has maybe not bought that much in this universe before, is starting to migrate this way. And that's a really great rising tide for companies in our sector. Um, <clears throat> one other concern that continues to come up is we have a lot of job losses, we're in a recession, what's going to happen going forward here, and are people going to be you know, pinching pennies and saving dollars? So one thing that we've been tracking here is what's going on with private label as a percentage of total grocery. And as you can see here, over the first three, three months, there was a very insignificant change in private label. 19.9% .9 of the total, 19.8, 19.9. And then starting in, in May and really accelerating in June, private label is declining. So people are becoming more and more brand loyal as they've come out of pantry loading and as they've moved more and more into wellness another great sign for our branded products in our industry. Um, and, and by the way, given the job losses have increased, a lot of people are longer out of work, a sign that people are buying better for you products because they're buying them for health and not because they have excess dollars. Um, this is a slide that we've, we've had before, but it just shows a very long-term picture of this to illustrate the point again. If you look at the dark bars, that's the growth in natural products and the gray bars are conventional grocery. On the bottom, we were trying to figure out why is the conventional grocery all over the place and the natural steady. The only thing we could find that correlated it was uh, US household income growth. And when you look at income growth, it was actually inversely correlated to the movements in conventional grocery. In other words, if income went down, conventional grocery went up and vice versa. The only theory I have in that is restaurant dollars were basically where that money would go. So if somebody was making more money, they were going to our restaurants and buying less conventional grocery. But what's interesting here is the natural product stays very, very level. There's a little dip in 19, which was just because the rate of growth in our industry slowed just a little bit. But this also illustrates that as personal income moves around, people are not skimping on natural products. People are moving into this and you can see the growth, this is growth rate uh, or growth dollars. The growth dollars of natural products continues to go up at a, at a very steady rate and this says basically that people are doing it because they want to buy wellness products for their health and not because of their budget. And now, Mike, I'm going to pass it back to you and not read our disclaimer. Sorry, Nick. Okay. Great. Thanks, Nick.